it really was pretty much the worst case scenario that any you know army could find themselves in it's one of these great what ifs you know if, if if they had surrendered it would have been possibly you know the biggest disaster that any british army had ever faced But yeah, maybe you could talk us through those opening moves of the war and, and that first first meeting of the of the two armies. Right. Yeah. Well, the the British were actually unready at that stage. Um, they they weren't expecting the Sikh army to cross so so quickly. So you know, the British force was actually quite sort of heavily divided at that stage. So you had you know the main force uh, under the commander in chief, Sir Hugh Gough, uh, in Delhi, Meerut sort of side. You had, uh, you know, about five or six thousand men uh, on the border already at Ferozpur. Uh, then you had a couple of thousand in Ludhiana, which is another sort of border town, if you like. Um, and then you had in the foothills uh, of the Himalayas another couple of thousand uh, men as well. So you had a little, you know, little odds and ends everywhere. Now the when the Sikh army crossed, the what they should have done, you know, if 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 the you know the commanders had that. Um, you know, um, uh, desire, um, they should have attacked these places and actually sort of mocked up, you know, the, the sort of smaller forces, if you like. But they didn't do that. They just marched across the river and uh, made camp at uh, Frosbur, um facing the British force, but not attacking it. And um, and then the, the other half of the Sikh army just stayed at a place called Ferozshah as well. So they literally were just waiting for the British to sort of uh, assemble their forces, if you like, um, and then take it from there, really. So that was a big mistake. Well, and, and, and was that a mistake or was that down to treachery, do you believe? Well, it was treachery. I, I, I don't think they had any particular desire to, um, you know, take the initiative. Um, there'd already been communication going on between uh, you know, Lal Singh and Tej Singh and the British anyway, where they were passing information as to, you know, what they were going to do. And they were even asking for instructions as well, you know, um, regarding, you know, what do you want us to do effectively? And uh, the answer was, you know, just keep the, the Sikh army there until, you know, um, Sir Hugh Goff comes up and, uh, you know, and, and it effectively um, takes them on. So, yeah, so the, the Sikh army was effectively sitting at Feroz Shah, and uh, that allowed the, the British force to sort of march up from Delhi and uh, come up to a place called Mudki, which was, you know, only about three or four miles from the Sikh camp. And what happened there? And, well, what happened was that the when the British reached Mudki, Lal Singh decided to send a portion of the Sikh army and, um, you know, effectively just to just split it even further. <laughs> and uh, so he sent uh, about nine to 10,000 men uh, against the British force, um, leaving, you know, around about 10,000 men at Ferozshah as well. And um, I think the idea was to really sort of, you know, so almost feed it to the British force, if you like, you know, get them to, to destroy it. Yeah, but basically destroy the, the force piecemeal. Um, but when the battle happened, um, it, it was a bit of a stalemate, actually. Uh, <laughs> If you ever go to Mudki, what you'll find is there's, a, or there used to be a jungle there. Um, there's a huge number of uh, these very strange sort of sandy hillocks everywhere, uh, just to explain the, the battlefield to everyone. So you've got jungle, you've got these sandy hillocks, you know, totally obscuring the view. You know, it's nighttime, you know, nobody can see anything, huge amount of dust in the air, and uh, you literally could not see, you know, five feet ahead of you. So... Um, you know, so you had this first battle between the Sikhs and the British fought in, you know, absolutely confused circumstances. And it sort of ended in a draw, effectively. So then what happened after Mudki then? So Hugoff decided to rest his force. And um, so they stayed there in Mudki for a couple of days. Uh, Mudki was fought on the 18th of December. And uh, on the 21st of December, he decided to then advance his force to Feroz Shah. So this was going to be the sort of, you know, the climax, if you like, because he's meeting the main Sikh force now uh, at Feroz Shah. And, um, you know, he was quite confident, uh, you know, despite Mudki, he thought that, um, you know, it's just a matter of just turning up, advancing. You know, he was the type that just liked to sort of advance with the bayonet and, um, you know, full frontal attack, you know, no 
no great sort of tactics or, or um, any sort of uh, strategy involved, you know, just, um, you know, just attack the, the Sikh army and he hoped it would just, you know, sort of uh, disintegrate. Um, and, um, you know, the battle will be over in a, an hour or so. And, uh, you know, the British force had just sort of make it way, its way back to, to Mudgi that same night. Um, so that was the that was a plan, but it didn't quite work out that way uh, uh, for the British. So, so what what happened then? So Goff Goff pushed forward towards uh, Ferrers Shah, and then what happened next? He just to give people a, a sort of uh, everyone a context of, of what was going on. The British force was about twenty thousand strong, and uh, same as the the Sikh army, about twenty thousand strong. So you had you know a roughly sort of equal contest, if you like. Um, the difference was that the the Sikh army had much better artillery. They'd brought along all their heavy guns, uh, whereas the British force had sort of lighter guns, um, a lot of them horse artillery. So, you know, th there was a big sort of uh, uh, difference in the, um, you know, the firepower, if you like, between the two forces. But Goff was confident, you know, he thought he could just attack. You know, the Sikh army would just, just, just... Uh, um, sort of run away, if you like, you know. Um, so he decided on a full frontal attack. You had the, um, you know, the artillery uh, opening up on both sides, you know, uh, to start off the, the contest. Within the hour, um, he found that, you know, all the British artillery had effectively been destroyed by um, the Sikh, um, Sikh guns, uh, which is, you know, must have come of come as a bit of a surprise, you know, because normally, you know, the British force was uh, always, uh, you know, uh, or certainly in the last 50 years had been quite superior to, to um, you know, other Indian armies. It was a bit of a bit of a shock there, I think. Um, and I understand so, there was a bit of a disagreement as well. I hear from your book, Goff was just wanted to keep going. And I think his second in command, who was also his civilian boss, is it Hardinge or Harding? Um, said, oh, this isn't a good idea. Are you sure you want to do that? Is that correct? That's right, yeah. I mean, Goff was uh, somebody who liked to, you know, just attack, you know, um, with whatever he's got, you know. Um, so Henry Harding, who was, uh, who was a, um, a soldier himself, um, basically put the leash on him. Um, you know, just before the battle, he told Goff that, you know, you've got to wait for reinforcements. And... Um, he didn't allow him to attack. You know, if, if Goff had attacked at that point with just the force he had, it would have been a, a complete disaster. Uh, but, you know, from the British aspect, you know, thanks to, you know, the governor general, he was stopped from attacking at that point. Um, he um, he had to wait for about five to 6,000 troops from uh, Ferozpur, which is, you know, where the, uh, the, you know, the British outlying station was, uh, frontier station was. Um, and with this force, you know, he was given the, the go ahead to attack. So it would almost definitely have been a, a disaster for the British, um, you know, uh, if, if, if he had actually gone at that point. So I guess just to explain, can you, can you maybe uh, um, explain for people this bizarre dynamic that we had in the British High Command between Goff and Harding? Uh, in terms of who was actually the boss. Can you just kind of explain how that bizarre situation came about and, and who they both were in relation to one another? Yeah, well, Sir Henry Harding, he, he was quite an experienced uh, uh, man himself. You know, he'd actually fought in the uh, Napoleonic Wars, but he was a civilian. You know, he was the, uh, the governor general, but he actually uh, decided to become uh, Goff's second in command, you know, um, so, you know, just to just, you know, because he wanted a role in the, you know, in, in the affair. But, you know, he could see that, you know, what had happened at Mudki uh, was going to happen in, in Frostchild as well. Um, so, you know, he very wisely decided to sort of step away from his second in command role and become the governor general uh, at that point and um, sort of forbade him to <laughs> attack at that point and uh, until the reinforcements came. And uh, then he sort of slipped back into his, um, you know, second in command role as well. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was quite a strange moment in 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 uh, um, in, in history, really, where uh, 
you know, you've got the governor general sort of, you know, uh, sort of competing with the uh, the commander in chief there. It's never going to end well, really. Knowing human nature, your boss can't also be your second in command. That's that's never going to end well. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I suppose it ended well for the British um, at, at Feroz Shah, but it, yeah, it could have been a, it could have been a very different affair, I think. Um, you know, if uh, if he had attacked without the reinforcements. So once these reinforcements arrive and he launches his attack, what happens? Can you give us a sense of, of may maybe just tell us the dates and then what happened and and sort of size of the forces and that sort of thing. Okay. Well, uh, the the British force. Once I'd got these reinforcements, advanced to Feroz Shah, it was about four o'clock and you're talking 21st December, which was actually the shortest day of the year. Uh, so by four o'clock, it's, it's, it's pitch dark or, you know, becoming very dark anyway. I'll tell you what, why don't I explain how the Sikh army was formed? OK, uh, yeah, that's good. Or, or was situated in the, in, at Feroz Shah. What, what the, the Sikh army had done was uh, formed a, almost a, a sort of rectangular defensive sort of compound, if you like. Feroz Shah was a village and the Sikh army had formed a, uh, a sort of uh, a defensive line all around the village, if you like, in a, in a, in a, in a rectangle. With the short end of the rectangle uh, pointing south from which the, you know, the side from which the, uh, the British were approaching from. So what Goff decided to do was attack on the, the west, western face, the, the eastern face, and from the south as well. So effectively, you know, he's attacking um, sort of almost sort of curving around, you know, the, the, the Sikh, um, Sikh position, if you like. Now, the, the attack on the western side was a complete failure. The British left uh, attacked the, the Sikh uh, western side of the uh, Sikh entrenchments um, and they were totally you know almost obliterated a lot of the the Sikh guns on that side uh, the Sikh strength uh, was on that side um, they literally attacked a couple of times and each time they were sort of pushed back that force was literally a spent force after that and Littler, Littler retreated to a village about three miles away um, and I've never quite figured that out. Why did he do that? Maybe it was just a confusion of the battle or, or whatever. But he effectively, you know, sort of departed the battle, if you like. So that division on that side was out of the battle for that day. So that left the, the British middle and right attacking. And these both these uh, divisions had much better luck. So they actually got into uh, the Sikh camp. And um, that's it from about five, five o'clock onwards, right up to, you know, nine, ten o'clock. Um, you had intense fighting inside the Sikh camp. In fact, Goff had his um, reserves, um, which he also threw in as well, uh, which was a dangerous move because, you know, if you've got no reserves, you're throwing everything in. Um, Especially if your left you know, flank's wide open. Well, that's right. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a it was a dangerous move. And if the Sikh cavalry, which which never got engaged in the battle, had decided to sort of wheel round, you know, it would have been a total disaster. Um, but he, he decided to take the risk anyway. So he, he effectively threw everything in. They managed to the British managed to capture about half the camp. But that was it. You know, that was a sort of high watermark, if you like, of, of, of the British um, attack. What they found was that, you know, all the soldiers are running out of ammunition. You know, basically, Goff didn't bring any of his um, supplies and what have you with him from Mudgi. You know, he thought that what he had with him would, would be sufficient. So they're literally fighting with the bayonet only, you know, gradually being pushed back as well. Um, you know, the, the Sikh army had effectively rallied. And, um, you know, the decision was taken that this is untenable. We can't stay here. Very dangerous position. You know, the Sikh army could literally, you know, encircle the British within the camp now. Um, so, the, you know, the decision was taken to, 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 to sort of come out of the, the camp and ret retreat about a mile and form a, a sort of defensive compound, if you like. So that, that's the way it ended probably about 12 o'clock, one o'clock at night. So at that point, you could say the battle was kind of uh, a, a sort of uh, a score draw, like no, no one was really victorious at that point. 
That's right, yes. I mean, it was a very difficult situation, though, for the British. You know, as I mentioned, they, they'd run out of ammunition. The, the British uh, artillery's been, you know, smashed to pieces. There's no food. There's no water as well. You know, all these guys, you know, all the all the uh, the British force had left very early on that day, uh, you know, starting at, uh, you know, five, six o'clock in the morning. They'd had nothing to eat the whole day, nothing to drink as well. It's also very cold as well. You know, this is, uh, you know, Punjabi nights tend to get, you know, seriously cold. Um, and these guys don't have any you know, baggage with them. There's no covering or anything. It really was pretty much the worst case scenario that any, you know, army can find themselves in. So, you know, uh, there's nothing there, effectively. And the British, they they considered retreating and even surrendering at at this point. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I think the I think the thought came across, you know, Harding's mind. Um, and probably Goff's mind as well. The option was either to to surrender or to retreat. Now, retreating might have sounded, you know, the better option. But, you know, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the jungle, it would have been very difficult for, you know, these men to actually make their way back, tired, exhausted. Uh, in fact, some of the, the officers were actually asked, you know, is it possible for us to retreat and uh you know after you know a whole day's marching whole day's fighting you know the, the officers simply said you know the, you know our men are too tired you know we're never going to make it the 10 12 miles back to mudiki or ferocia you know it's just not possible so we have to stay here what goff decided to do was just chance it you know the next day um he was a you know, chancer he wasn't to... he <laughs> yeah yeah he... <laughs> there's a there's quite a famous line i don't know if i've got it with me actually Somebody asked him, shall we um, basically surrender or, you know, shall we retreat? And uh, no, he said, you know, I'd rather die on the spot. (laughs) You know, he basically wanted to uh, just chance it uh, the next day, effectively. Um, Well, I guess his career uh, would have been completely ruined if he'd have surrendered. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, it's one of these great what ifs, you know, if, if, if they had surrendered, you know, it would have been uh, uh, possibly, you know, the biggest disaster that, you know, any British army had ever faced, you know, because you had the, you had the British commander in chief there, uh, you know, you had the governor general there as well. Uh, mm. You know, both these guys would have been, you know, captured or taken prisoner. You know, you had, um, um, you know, a whole host of, you know, British generals there, the, the majority of the the European regiments in North India were were in the battle, so you know it was a very tricky situation. It wasn't just uh, the the army surrendering. You know uh, they also had to look at you know the British position in in the rest of India. A complete disaster at Ferozshah would have you know what were the implications of that? You yeah. know all across India, very big decision. Uh, yeah, especially given the defeat at Kabul only a few years before. I mean, I guess it would have just marked potentially the end of the British Empire in India at that point, if, if they had have surrendered? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think a lot of the um, the Indian states, you know, the Indian Rajas uh, around the country would have probably taken the opportunity to, you know, reassert their independence. You know, the British simply wouldn't have had, you know, the troops to, to sort of deal with the situation. Um and, um, you know, the loss of prestige, if you like, you know, because you had the Anglo-Afghan war where, you know, that had been a, a disaster, uh, effectively, uh, you know, the retreat from Kabul. And that was still fresh in people's minds. You know, that was just, uh, you know, three years earlier, um, three and a half years earlier. Yeah, very big decision. <laughs> <laughs> but then and, uh, uh, I, I believe... Uh... Goff, Goff was very, very lucky and yet again sort of seek infighting and treachery saved the day. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, well, um, they were expecting the worst, uh, Goff and Harding. Uh, what actually happened was that the Sikh army left Frosthar during the night, which was a big surprise to them when they woke up. Um, you know, they were expecting the, you know, a sort of counterattack by the Sikh army to sort of uh, finish them off. And... Um, complete silence the the british force once they got up actually sort of combed their way through the whole of the the sikh camp 
and um, you know through minimal resistance really. What had happened was that um, Lal Singh, uh, who was the uh, guy in charge of the of the Sikh army there, basically decided, you know, this isn't on. Let's 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 retreat. He probably just didn't want to win at that stage. You know, he didn't want to compromise his position with the British. And because um, so he was one of the ones made... sort of dealing uh, insider dealing with the British, is that right? He was he was one of those you know hoping for a good position uh, after the war. That's right. Yeah, he was the prime minister. Um, he, he basically he had no military experience. Um, so he wasn't really a military man, but nevertheless he was he was commanding um, at that you know at that battle. You know he made the decision to to, to leave, and um, you know all the guns, all the Sikh guns were left there, all the supplies, baggage, everything. You know um, the order was given just to you know march across the border back into you know Lahore territory again. You know it was one of the great sort of let offs really in in sort of military history really. Uh, certainly surprised Goff um, and Harding when they got up. Um, <laughs> A nice pleasant surprise. You know, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, there was a second let off as well. The the next day, you know, one said combed their way through, you know, the Sikh camp, and uh, they thought the battle was over. Most of the force disintegrated, you know. There were British soldiers, you know, looking for water, looking for food, you know. They hadn't eaten the whole of the previous day, the whole of the night, you know, absolutely famished. So the whole force basically was scanning through, you know, the, the Sikh camp, looking for food and, you know, settling down. And uh, as soon as that happened, uh, another Sikh army suddenly appeared, um, from the west, and um, you know that was the army of Dej Singh, who'd been stationed at Ferozpur. He hadn't attacked, you know, Ferozpur. He was just sitting there. Um, his men had sort of harangued him to, you know, help the Sikh army at mm. Ferozshah. He was sort of browbeaten into um, sort of advancing. So about uh, two hours after um, the the British thought the you know the battle had ended. And, you know, they've got the Sikh entrenchments. Suddenly there's a there's another army, you know, standing in front of them and, um, you know, ready for the attack. Um, but that was a let off as well. You know, after a, a short sort of artillery um, exchange, Tej Singh actually led that army away as well. Um, so, you know, that was a that was a second let off, if you like. Um, and what, what was his reasoning for leading his army away? Well, you see, this is one of the. The really weird things, you know, he um, his explanation was that uh, a British uh, move to his right uh, was some sort of flanking move. You know, he made this sort of excuse. You know, we better help Lal Singh's uh, army who had already, you know, departed. So he made all sorts of excuses, and this didn't really wash with the uh, um, the Sikh um, soldiers. And uh, there's, there's a there's a, there's a famous story of, written by Carmichael Smythe, uh, one of the uh, British historians, about a, a Sikh uh, cavalryman, you know, telling him you're a traitor, you know, um, and um, just riding back to his line, you know, after that. The, the Sikh soldiers knew they were being, uh, you know, sort of uh, double-crossed at this point. But, you know, there was this residual sort of uh, discipline, if you like. They couldn't just, you know, get rid of him. Um, they couldn't just pick some soldier to lead them at that stage and you know there wasn't that sort of uh, organization there so so that army was actually led off back across the border as well um so yeah two let offs in uh, in one day um for the british force i mean m maybe we're going off on a tangent here but as as a sikh yourself someone from the punjab when you read that history and you see that even with half an army even badly led by people who were essentially traitors you still nearly beat, you know, the, the greatest power of the day worldwide. Um, how mad does that make you <laughs> to kind of think of what could have been or maybe what should have been? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great it's a great talking point in Punjab. You know, um, you know, you, have, you go to uh, any of the Punjabi villages anywhere and you talk about Lal Singh and Tej Singh, you know, and people will spit on the ground, you know. <laughs> The, the level of treachery uh, was, you know, absolutely, you know, horrendous. I don't think they'll ever be forgotten in, you know, in Sikh history, you know, in, you know, in the Sikh community. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly makes, you know, it's very um, um, frustrating. You know, if you if you look at it, if you look at the what ifs, you know, if 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 they'd actually been loyal to their troops, what could have happened? You know, um, 
you know, my personal feeling is, that, you know, it would have been, um, you know, one of the most um, uh, famous battles in history, really, you know, simply because it would have, you know, it was sort of almost overturning the British Empire in one battle. Mm -hmm.